And welcome, the biggest welcome to week two of PLM's Month of Marketing. Um, Month of Marketing is my November webinar series where every week I will be live with you on Zoom interviewing an industry expert. Um, I am Sophie. If you haven't seen me before, hello. I'm the founder of PLM, Pretty Little Marketer. And PLM is an online community for people in and on social media. Um, we are, well, I am <laughs> across socials, have a weekly newsletter, and you can find me everywhere at Pretty Little Marketer. Um, today is week two. Last week, we had Leah Tana talking to us about all things LinkedIn, and you can find the replay on my website, prettylittlemarketer.com. Um, but today is week two, and I am so excited. Um, I am being joined by the amazing Jasmine, storyteller, copywriter for Fortune 500 brands, ex-rapper, amazing father, um, and kindly giving us an hour of his very precious time today. Um, Jasmine, introduce yourselves to everyone today. I like how you threw in that ex-rapper. So uh -huh. Because we want the story. So, hey, everyone. <laughs> oh, we can talk about it. All good. <laughs> no, hey, everyone. Where's my camera? Right here. So yeah, I am Yasmin Alich. Everybody knows me as Jay. Pretty active on LinkedIn. The short of what I do is I help brands with their messaging. The long version is I'm a copywriter. I'm a brand strategist. I also dabble in being a creative director. I also teach copywriting at the university level. I'm also a content creator on LinkedIn. Just a whole bunch of stuff, but it, it really boils down to writing and just the art of communication. So hopefully we'll have a good time today. Leave everything you want inside the comment section. There's also a Q&A box. So if you want any questions answered today, just instead of the chat, please feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. So yeah, let's have a good time. Hello, Sophie. By the way, Sophie, I have to say something before we start. You are an inspiration. And I feel like you don't get enough credit for everything you do for the marketing community, for the LinkedIn creator community, Instagram, everywhere. And yeah, I just want to say it's a pleasure and you're an inspiration. So you go. No, you can make me cry. That's too kind. I think I'm just so deeply British. So I hate taking compliments, but cannot appreciate it more. And coming from you as well, someone that I look up to so, so much. You're amazing. And we appreciate your time so much today. Um, Most so today we're going to be talking right better so better um a very ominous title very intriguing um we're going to be unpacking that with you today um before we dive in before i ask you to tell us a bit more about your story and we talk all things copy um for anyone who isn't aware how would you explain or describe what copywriting or storytelling actually is Okay, so for me, just to give you some bit of background, for me, copywriting, and I always say this, copywriting is not about writing. Copywriting is actually about understanding humans, how we communicate, how we perceive information, and then transforming that into text. Copy is actually text. So we can easily just swap, you know, swap out the copy for the word text. So it's essentially text writing. So any text you see around you, billboard ads, digital media, LinkedIn posts, Instagram posts, the stuff you see inside videos like the captions, the descriptions, newspaper articles, blogs, any piece of text around us is considered copy. And the way we write it is actually vastly different from medium to medium. So the way you write a billboard ad is actually quite different. The process is different. The thinking behind it is different from the way you write like an article online. So yeah, copywriting to me in a nutshell is the art of communication, mm -hmm. but even more so it's about human psychology and just understanding how humans perceive and consume content, how to consume text. Yeah. So yeah, text writing, the art of communication, everything in between. So yeah, okay. that for me, copywriting is just that. I love that definition. I think, um, so I have been in marketing practicing for two and a half years, um, but I started my introduction to marketing was in 2018 when I started my degree. Um, and I think up until probably this year, so a, a few years experience under my belt, hopefully some level of education too. 
I had no clue what copywriting actually was. Um, and even still up until recently, once I did have a brief level of what it meant, for me, it was just like, okay, copywriting is writing. If I'm writing a caption, I'm simply doing copywriting. But as you have explained that so well, there's so much more to it. Um, the copywriters of the world, underappreciated. You do so, so much. Amazing. So on the note, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly do the your bedtimes, your awake times, you know, how you do all insane. Um, but let's rewind. So this is what copywriting means to you now. Um, but I would love to dive into your story a little bit before we talk all of the clever copywriting things about how you got into copywriting. Um, I know your journey started somewhere vastly different. So rewind us a little and then we'll dive into all the fun clever stuff. Okay, so there's actually the long version of this story. <laughs> and there's a very short version of the story. The short version is I got on Upwork. I think it was around 2012 mm -hmm. and I was just looking for additional income. I was a student back then and yeah, I needed some additional money basically. So I started writing articles because that's what I already had experience in. And a couple of years later, it was actually around 20, late 2013, I will actually say not 2014. I, I, I kept seeing these ads, you know, I kept seeing these job postings that said, copywriting, web copy, ad copy. And I'm like, why am I still stuck on articles and blogs? So I was like, let me see what this is about because I had no idea what copywriting even meant. And I checked it out and I was like, I know how to do this. So I just applied. I kind of convinced them that I knew how to do it. Yeah. And um, I got my first job. And ever since then, I've just been learning and upskilling and leveling up and learning and upskilling. So that's the short story, really just <laughs> finding the word, reading the word copywriting for the first time on Upwork and then just diving into it straight away. The long version as to why I said I already know how to do this mm -hmm. is I used to be a rapper back in the day and you introduced it briefly in the very beginning. And I used to do my own social media like everything literally everything the outreach the posts the, the commenting i used to do all my emailing my pr all the communication with the radio the newspaper people everything 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 i did my own website so in a nutshell i was kind of already doing copy i was writing copy 24 7 but i just didn't know that's what it was i didn't know that's what it was called you know, so yeah, back, back then, like when I first heard heard about it, I was like, I already know how to do this. And then when I started, finally, it was actually good. And I, I think I, because of that, I did have some advantage because I already did it in the past. But yeah, that's how I got into it. And ever since then, it's just been a smooth ride, I want to say, but there have been plenty of bumps in the road. And <laughs> yeah, we can we can talk about everything. Amazing. Oh, I love that so much. We actually first met a few weeks ago. We had a Zoom call to obviously plan and discuss our, our session and invite you to share your wisdom with the PLM community. And um, when you told me your origin story, like my mind was just absolutely blown. I think that is the coolest <laughs> thing. And I love how life's almost brought you like full circle um, yeah. from writing back in the day to doing exactly that now. Um, I fully believe everything happens for a reason and all of the lessons we're taught in life are for our next step. So I think that your story exemplifies that really, really well. I love it. I um, couldn't agree more. It's definitely a full circle story. Absolutely. Amazing. So I have got a few questions for you today okay. that we're going to dive into and kind of steal your wisdom. Um, but guys watching, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, um, pop them in the Q&A box. Um, we will get to them at the end. If any questions pop up throughout that could be applicable, I'll try and like do some brain work and, and ask them as and when, but pop them in the Q&A box um, and we'll get through as many as possible. Um, and yes, the session will be available to watch after. It'll be on my website. Well, give me an hour after we end and maybe I'll, uh, I would have done it by then. But um, but yes, give me an hour and we'll dive in. Uh, amazing. Um, so something that I have seen you say on LinkedIn and heard you say when we last caught up um, is that the key to great copywriting is understanding humans. Um, I know you said it there in your introduction as well, that it's all about people, people's psychology, understanding them. Can you expand on this a little bit? Why is it key? Um, and when you are writing for people, how do you start that process? Yeah, 
So as I said, copywriting is really just about understanding humans and how we consume text. I'll give you a few examples. Like just you and I, Sophie, we met on LinkedIn, right? So we, leave, we read a ton of LinkedIn posts every single day. And which one is harder to read? Like a giant post that is like a block of text is just literally like a slab, even though like the information inside that might be super good and super useful. Our brains are trained to just say, no, it's too much. It's not for me. Or even if you had like that same exact information from that post, but it was slightly more formatted, slightly more tailored to how we consume text. You know, I feel like this second version is much easier to read, therefore much easier to understand and therefore much easier to act on. And I feel like these are the three steps for any copy to be successful. You need to grab attention, meaning you need to convince them that they should start reading. That's the first step. Like, I, I talk about this with my students all the time. Right now, brands are not actually fighting with each other anymore. Like when we think about competition, like let's say you were Apple or you were Samsung or whoever, you're no longer just competing with your competitors. You're competing with everyone, literally everyone, because we have this fight for attention. There's so much content around us, whether it's on social media, whether it it's when you go outside and you look at all these billboards and all those posters plastered all over the all over town. Or if you open up any magazine and newspaper, um, there's just a whole bunch of ads, a whole bunch of text everywhere you, you look. So the first step is usually grabbing attention. And how do you do that? You do that by keeping it very short, very simple, and relevant to the actual audience. That's the key. So once you grab their attention, then it's on to the formatting, to how you tell your story, how you actually promote your content or your offering or your product or your service. And there's a bunch of ways you can do that. But the one key thing inside that process, at least for me and my experience has been, if you make it about the customer, they'll make it about you. And this means if you're like, we see this all the time, whenever brands describe what they do or they wanna promote a certain product, downloadable juice, chocolate box, whatever, they start with we. And that is such a bad way to approach any copywriting, any sort of brand messaging, because it's supposed to be about the audience. They don't connect to we, right? You connect to that, but they don't. So if we just flip the script and make it about the customer, now, whether it's a problem you're going to describe so that they can say, oh, that's right, I'm experiencing that or whether it's a benefit immediately at the very beginning or an experience, right? They need to have something to hook onto. So step one is grabbing their attention. But then if you lose that attention immediately by talking about something that's irrelevant to them, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And then it's really about once you've actually convinced them, once you've actually written something that's relevant to them, something they can connect with, something that's actually valuable to them, then you can get to the actual call to actions. And you can count on some sort of result. But everything before that, that's the key part. And it's it's challenging for any creative person, especially copywriters. Like by nature, we're just creative. We're often referred to as wordsmiths, right? And it's in our nature to just want to come up with the punchiest copy, with the flashiest wording, the phrases and whatever. But then it becomes a battle of creativity and clarity. And for me, at least in my experience, clarity has always been the winner. It's not eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, it's 10 times out of 10. Clear beats crushes clever every single time. So I think feel like uh, just to um, summarize this, there are two key messages here. Yeah. First, always make sure that whatever sort of messaging and copy you put out there, make sure it's about the customer. It's not about you. Make sure that there's something in there that they can connect with. And second, make sure you're talking, you're speaking clearly, not creatively, because too creative is too risky. And we see this all the time. Like there are a lot of these campaigns out there or ads specifically where we're like, oh, that's an amazing ad. Mm -hmm. And then it stops. Yeah. There's no other action following that. So I always tell brands that I work with, would you rather have a reaction that says, Oh my God, that's so cool. Oh, that's such a creative ad. And then nothing, crickets. Or would you rather have the reaction that says, oh my God, I want that. Oh my God, that's for me. Oh my God, I need that. 
there's a clear difference. And creative usually gets one sort of reaction, which is that, it's so cool. But clear usually gets a reaction that leads to a sale. Mm -hmm. So yeah, copywriting is clear, super fast, super simple, but also always needs to kind of lead to a sale or some sort of tangible result. I love that. Clear beats clever absolutely awesome I am um, when I'm writing my LinkedIn post sometimes I like totally overthink things and I'm like I need loads of words to convey my point or even in Instagram content but like you said clear how simple can we make it for the audience I think it was um when Apple first announced the iPod what yeah. feels like years ago um the ad was like that a thousand or like x amount of um songs in your yeah pocket um and I love that I feel like it's used so commonly when we refer to copywriting and advertising so a thousand words in your pocket I, I, I want that I don't necessarily want to spend a hundred pounds on an iPod but I know yeah. that I have those songs in my pocket so I'm probably going to beg for it for Christmas um I never did get an iPod um I got a Sony MP3 player. Me too. The Walkman, was it? Yes, it was. Yep. There we go. Awesome. That's clearly what the cool kids had. So now I feel much better about myself. Yeah. Um, mine was hot pink. My love for pink, like it was bathed with me. Um, and I begged, I begged for the pink one. And I got it. <laughs> Excuse me. Someone's wearing all the pink today. So. Oh, I love it. <laughs> By the way, just a background story on why this hoodie is actually here. <laughs> Uh, I see somebody already asked in the Q&A box, where can we get a PLM hoodie? So just so you know, Sophie, this is bound to happen. I love it on my to list. <laughs> but the background story is my brand colors are sort of a mix between green and blue, so a teal or a turquoise sort of color. That's my brand. Mm -hmm. um, and when I posted the announcement about this webinar on my LinkedIn, everybody was like, oh my God, Jay, pink looks so good on you. And at first I thought somebody was teasing me, but then I saw like hundreds of comments literally saying the same thing. And I'm like, okay, confidence level up. I'm gonna create my own pink hoodie. And here it is today. So that's the background of it. We love it. And we can confirm pink does look good on you. No one was teasing you. It's the truth. Thank I you. think pink looks Very the much. best one. <laughs> it's the best color, um, of course, because it's piano colors. Um, so I love your commitment to commitment to the team. It's awesome. We love to see BLM, it. BLM, always. Amazing. So clear, beats, clever. There's takeaway number one. If you're rounding up for a LinkedIn post, that's got to be point number one. Amazing. Um, Something that I bang on about a lot, especially on Instagram, is this thought of like personalization. Um, my recommendation to people online is to always be them, type how they talk, try and inject their personality into everything they do. Um, because personalized copy speaks personally. Um, I think Amelia Sordell regularly stares, shares a statistic, she's in the personal branding space, about how people have five times the reach of brands. Um, and it's because people love people. Um, but when we're posting as a brand and not as a person, sometimes it can be really difficult to bring that personalized, fun, human element. Um, I know this is something you are awesome at and a question that I'm really excited to hear your answer to. Um, so would love to hear a little more about this thought of how can we or how can brands be more than just a logo, be a bit more personable and be more person. Okay, I feel like for me at least that's a very super easy answer. Mm -hmm. And it starts with the very definition of all these acronyms like B2B, B2C, right? And that is usually where the trouble starts. People think just because a lot of these like company profiles have to be B2B, like business to business, like the communication has to be formal. Excuse me? No. Or if it's B2C, it has to come like from a higher ground and you speak sort of, you almost like you speak down to your customers, like you have to convince them to buy a product. Sorry? No. We need to understand something. All marketing, all communication is P2P, people to people. Mm -hmm. Every single time. And yeah, there's actually been uh, extensive research about that. Uh, personal profiles get like 500% plus more engagement than company profiles on any, any sort of social media um, platform. And how can a brand be more than just a logo? 
right? How can you be, how can you like inject this sort of personality into your brand? It starts with how you communicate. If you, you can approach the way you communicate, not as robotic, I feel like business communication is usually very formal, very robotic. It's almost like it's emotionless. Like it doesn't have any sort of human element inside it. If we can just ingest these little teeny tiny bits of personality inside the messaging, that's when everything starts to perform better. And there's super simple ways to do this. And I actually analyze this myself. This is no scientific research and anything formal. Just using adjectives. Mm -hmm. Like this is a, a ridiculous example, but a lot of business profiles, they focus too much on just announcing stuff, describing stuff, but whenever they are describing stuff, they're not using adjectives. Mm -hmm. I feel like as people, we are bound to descriptions, right? Whenever you say we have an all-in-one tool, ah, okay, everyone says that. But if you say we have a super, we have a powerful tool, right? That can do something, something, something. All of a sudden it sounds, it's, it's just, a, it sounds better. It's yeah. just the way you use words as a human being. Don't try to make it sound like a brand, make it sound like a human. Mm -hmm. And that's just one random example, just using more adjectives. And this is, I don't know if this is confirmed or if this is widely known or widespread or whatever, but it's just something I've noticed over the years. Like whenever you compare company profiles communication with personal profiles or personal brands communication, you'll see that difference. Personal brands usually use a lot more adjectives. They're a bit more descriptive because they want you to feel emotion. And I feel like brands on company profiles, they're scared of emotion almost. They feel like they're losing their personality where it's the actual opposite. You're not losing personality. You're actually creating and adding to your personality. So that's how you become more than just a logo. That's how your brand then starts to feel like it's communicating with its audience. Like it's people to people, genuinely. There's good ways to do it. There's bad ways to do it. Obviously, there's some super creative ways to do it. For me, I always give the example of dbrand. They do skins and protective cases and whatever for, for phones and laptops and all sorts of tech. And their communication is, it's kind of like you mix Jimmy Carr, the stand-up comedian, and Bill Burr and... Whoever is like the, the most insulting and funny at the same time, that's their, their sort of brand messaging. That's their personality. They'll roast you inside the comments, right? They'll, they'll talk to you like they're right there with you at the table, drinking coffee with you. That's how they talk. And they'll incite, insult you to your face. But it's so funny because that's part of their brand messaging. Yeah. Right? And I feel like if you take a look at like regional, I'm not trying to bash Samsung or anything, but like regional Samsung communication. Like they have profiles for every single region, country almost, I feel like. It's almost like they're just copy pasting stuff from the FAQ section. Yeah. Right. It doesn't have personality. I get it. You're a bigger brand. You're trying to have less risk in your communication, but it doesn't feel as personalized. I feel like I'm talking to a robot, like an answering machine on the other side of the country of the world. And I'm not talking to a person on the other end. So for me, that's the key difference. Just ingesting, injecting some sort of personality into your copy, into the way you post, into the way you comment, into the way you respond to people. And it's super easy, actually. It's just that brands are typically scared of it or they don't understand that all marketing, all communication, it's supposed to be P2P, people to people, because I mean, all businesses have people. They're not run by robots. So, you know, that's that's my take on it. Yeah, that's absolutely awesome. P to P, people to people, person to person. I love also that example you gave of all in one tool. Awesome. You know, I know that it does everything I need to, but powerful, all in one tool, powerful tool. Just that one word. Totally see what you mean. Amazing. Um, Grace has a really good question, actually, in the Q&A box. Uh, okay. And Grace has asked, how do we use adjectives without it sounding fluffy? Um, so really good question, Grace. Okay, so Grace, I, I advise you go to Eddie Schleiner's website, verygoodcopy.com. He's got amazing examples that I can't think of the top of my head right now. Um, but the, the gist of it is 
does it sound good? So there's two ways you can uh, approach adjectives inside your copy. There is the big word version, right? So you can say powerful. Mm -hmm. And there is the more humanized version that says very strong. Mm -hmm. And typically, like when you put these two pieces of copy written in the same exact way, but just writing adjectives either with a bigger word or with a very and then something yeah. or strongly or, you know, whatever. It's a different feeling. One is sounding like marketing copy. The other one sounds like human copy. And it really depends on the example. It really depends on the brand. How do you want it to sound? Do you want it to sound like it belongs on a billboard? Because oftentimes you will need to adjust it if it belongs on a billboard. Or do you want it to sound like it belongs on a social media in a, in a social media post or a comment? In that case, you will need to adjust it for that. But it's just that slight difference. And I feel like Eddie, in one of his recent um, micro articles, that's what he calls them, he explained it perfectly. Um, whenever you're using bigger words and just more human words with like very and then the, another adjective, it's a very big difference in, as to how it sounds. So hopefully that answers the question. Awesome. I love that. I'm trying to make it feel... short just to not get into like the whole weed, uh, the, the weeds and the details. So. Totally. No, I love that. Um, oh, a few really good questions. Um, one from Roman on what you're saying here as well, um, who has said, isn't very a filler word that we should avoid? What do you think? I actually, it, it depends on the medium. I actually think it's a very good human word, awesome. if that makes sense, how to describe it. Because there is a big difference in saying this is a good post and this is a very good post right? Or this is a strong post. This is a you. This is a useful post. There's different ways to go about it. But using the word very in the right context can give very good, you know, create, create very good results. So yeah, if, if we're talking articles and you're just doing it for the word count and you just don't need that word there, sure, it's a filler word. But if you're talking social media posts and if you're talking billboard ads and if you're talking um, e even like video scripts right for commercials and whatever like it does make a pretty big difference awesome really good to know i i feel like i use the word very all the time or i use like super like rather than just being like awesome it's like that's super awesome <laughs> yeah exactly so in that case super it's like almost sounds like a filler you could just say it's uh -huh. awesome yeah right i love that Awesome. Um, oh, there, there we go again. I am. Um, so when I first graduated, I worked in events um, and like half of my job was kind of being in a course center where I would organize events with clients and the other half was organizing it. And um, I would always, when I was on the phone, a client, you know, they'd be like, I want this, but like, awesome. Next. Oh yeah, that's awesome. And I would totally overuse the word. So on my desk, my colleagues got me a list of other words that I could use that weren't awesome so I had like fantastic amazing that's great thank you and I would have it in my eye line um because I'm a sucker for <laughs> that one word I'm the worst me too um, I love big words actually and I had this competition with a friend back in my university days where we would literally go through this was back in my rapper days as well so I was kind of studying new words just to use them in my in my in my lyrics and we would actually compete every single day like who's gonna learn like 10 either super long or super like not so frequent words, right? So I know a lot of big words and I know a lot of these like zenith. Like when the hell would you use zenith in like <laughs> right in like daily communication? Like I'm at the zenith of my career. Like, well, you can say I'm at the peak of my career, right? It, it's like sometimes big words don't necessarily give big results because they're too big to understand. Mm -hmm. And it, I feel like it leads back to what we said at the very beginning, you know, just uh, using big words doesn't necessarily make you clever. Yeah. It actually makes your copy harder to understand sometimes. Oh, I love that. Guys in the chat, totally off topic, but sort of on topic, let us know what's the biggest word you know. Um, because I would I would love to know. Because I now I think about it, I don't think I know very many big words. Um, and now I wish I did. Um, when I was younger, my mum would read a page of the dictionary every day. I don't know <laughs> why. Um, I don't know if she remembers any of the words that she learned this was probably about 20 years ago but maybe I should start doing that too but guys what's the biggest word you know <laughs> pop it in the chat we'll have a little read through shortly 
Um, so the title of today's session, which I hope you guys are enjoying so far, by the way, I know I am, uh, but this isn't for me, it's for you. Um, title of today's session is Write Better, Sell Better. Um, it's something that you say, you unpack um, on LinkedIn often, you teach it often. Um, so my question on this is, can you unpack your top, I'm sure you'll have many, uh, but top three tips on writing better to sell better. Yeah, I I will try because I have more than three actually. <laughs> um, just for context, I teach this to my students all the time. We have 12 copywriting principles mm -hmm. and we revise them, we repeat them at the beginning of every single week. Wow. Mm -hmm. And there's 12 of them, but I'll try to pick uh, because some of them relate to human psychology. Some of them relate to um, formatting, like visual formatting, and some of them relate to information, like what's inside. So I'll try to pick my best for each category. So for the uh, psychological part of it, I feel like the one that I already mentioned, make it about the customer, they'll make it about you. That's, that's the principle. Make it about them, they'll make it about you. Because if you're describing solutions first and then jumping into the problem, it doesn't work because they can't connect to the solution. They first need to connect to a problem, right? So whether you're writing a social media post, whether you're pushing a, a billboard or an out of home campaign out there, whether you're doing commercials for YouTube or for TV even, first make sure that there's something that the audience can connect to. Whether that's a problem, whether that's a craving, something they really need in their life, whether it's like a super duper good thing that will make their life better, make sure you lead with that first because the audience needs to have something to connect to. They need to feel the copy. And I feel like this is such an underrated statement because when you say read the copy, understand the copy, get persuaded by the copy, act on the copy, it's not as strong as if you say feel the copy. So if your ideal customer, if your buyers, if your followers on social media can feel what you're saying, meaning it actually matters to them, it's actually valuable to them, that's when you know your copy is effective. So always lead with something that they can connect with, whether that's a problem, whether that's something they need, et cetera, et cetera. Always lead with that. Make it about them. They'll make it about you. And I write this all the time in my comments on LinkedIn. So I'm pretty sure some people are familiar with this. Uh, the second thing I would say, it's going to be about the way we include information. And I'm going to connect it to the first one. I always say lead with experiences, lead with solutions, right? Sorry, uh, lead with um, benefits, sorry, <laughs> not solutions, lead with benefits. Mm -hmm. And you have touched upon this with the iPhone example, with the iPod, right? Example, right? It's like, if you say, there's also a good example with Apple Music recently. Um, I'll give you two examples of ads and this could easily be a social media post. This could easily be a YouTube video. If you say 10 terabytes for Apple Music, 1 million songs across your Apple devices. Okay, that's factually true. It's informational, it's educational, but if you're leading with the terabytes, I, it doesn't mean anything to me, <laughs> right? But if you're leading with how many songs I can have on all my devices, like just flip the script. Don't introduce the feature first, introduce the benefit, the actual experience first. If you tell me 1 million songs on your Apple Watch, I mean, hell yeah, you know, it's, it's an experience. So if you lead with that, it immediately changes how we psychologically perceive your brand, right? The benefit is in focus. And then you can say what the feature is that enables that benefit. So then you can say 10 with 10 terabytes for Apple Music. It's a big difference. But just starting with something first, meaning something to connect with, that's that makes a very big difference. So experience and benefits first, solution second, or feature second. So that's that's um, just about information. And I feel like the third one could be about formatting. Um, I have a bunch of these, actually. Uh, when it comes to formatting, I'm, I'm really big on keeping all the copy I write very simple and very short. There's two things about this people don't actually think about copy as visual, right? 
every text, every piece of text is visual first. Because again, if it looks like a giant slab, like a giant long paragraph, our brains are trained to say, no, not for me too much. I don't have that time. Remember like attention spans that are shortening and shortening and shortening. There's this example floating around that's been floating around recently with the goldfish and how it has like a, a nine second attention span. And research has confirmed that humans nowadays have it around five or six seconds. Personally, I feel like it's even shorter. I feel like it's around two or three seconds because just think about how you use TikTok and Instagram or LinkedIn even. It's like, boom, not for me, boom, not for me, boom, not for me. And then you see something that's visually pleasing and then you're like, ah, it's for me. Sure. So you have like two to three seconds to catch someone's attention. And it really has to do with formatting, how you write your posts. So some of my rules are, if there's too much copy, make it choppy. So chop it up into pieces. So let's say you have a giant paragraph, right? Just break it down into, into more sentences. It's not going to look longer because you're going to have white space in between. It's actually going to look more pleasing to the eye. Aesthetically pleasing text is inviting to read. It actually signals that this is something that's easy to read, therefore easier to understand. But if it's the other way around, doesn't matter how much quality you have packed in there, people are just not gonna even want to read it, yeah. right? And I like to, I always like to say like, there's another challenge inside of that. Like whenever we're chopping stuff up, we try to make it shorter. And sometimes, and I have this challenge basically every single day in my work, it's like all the information needs to be there. Yeah. It's like, how do you uh, um, approach having this giant slab of text and you can't really erase anything? Mm -hmm. So how do you now make it even like, like how do you include all the information that's A and B, how do you make it inviting to read? So I say, if you can't erase it, give it some space. Yeah. So just, it's, it's the same principle really, just break it down into shorter, simpler sentences or even, if you can, it this doesn't even have to be a paragraph. It could be like a giant long sentence. If you can uh, segment or chop the sentence up into like much smaller, much shorter um, sentences that, are, that usually have like two, three, four words max, that's, that's good. Like that's super easy to consume. That's super easy to look at. And it could be transformed into anything really. Like imagine if you had a billboard ad downtown and it has like a paragraph of text. Now imagine that same billboard that has three lines and in each line you have only three words. Like that's super easy to read. But even more than that, like it's visually appealing. It invites you to read. So those are some principles. I feel like if I could summarize, it would be make it about the customer, they'll make it about you. The second thing is if there's too much copy, just make it choppy. Really just find ways to simplify it because our brains, it's just a battle for attention nowadays. Our brains are trained to get this signal that says that's too much for me and I'm not even going to read it. So you have to battle that. And yeah, the third thing is if if um, if there's not enough, sorry, if you can't erase it, give it some space. So um, it's it's just, I feel like formatting has a lot to do with it. And my biggest gripe with copywriting is whenever I get like a word count limit, that's that's a tough challenge. I, I recently did a campaign where we needed a very strong billboard campaign outdoors. And we limited ourselves. I'm, I'm not sure who limited who, but I was limited at the very end where I had like, oh, we need four words max for each billboard. And I'm like, how do we do this? And then you get an additional challenge where we had like 10 words, 15 words, and all of the all of the words, like all of the information needed to be inside. And I'm like, how do I do four words total? And then I have all of this that I need to include. And then my creative mind started thinking, I was like, why don't we just do three billboards right next to each other? Oh, cool. We can even like take just one horizontal one and make three vertical ones, right? So it looks like it's three separate ads as one. So that's what we ended up doing actually. And it worked. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's just weird challenges when you have to work with very short copy, but that's what works because that's how we process information nowadays. Yeah. Oh my goodness. 
I feel like my mind has been blown a hundred times. I'm going to have to rewatch this session and physically take notes because that was so insightful. I don't think I've ever thought of copy as a visual. I always think of like visuals being text or video and then copy something to accompany it. Obviously, I work in social. So for me, that would be an infographic or a caption. Um, but like, recognizing that text is visual oh my goodness guys plm content's about to get a trillion times better um because <laughs> of today's yeah. amazing and, Thank and you so there's much. there's another element to this sophie i feel like we haven't touched on it um because the title of the session is write better sell better i always tell my students and whoever i work with like whenever i work with clients if your copy doesn't convert right? If it doesn't convert the visitors, the readers into buyers, it has failed. Like there's, I hate sugarcoating things. I don't want to, like there's these big brand awareness campaigns out there, but it's the stuff that we talked at the very beginning. It's like a lot of times brands lose money on these creative campaigns that are super creative. Like most people will reshare this a thousand million freaking times on social media, but the reaction is still going to be to say, oh my God, this is so cool. This is so creative. But more often than not, those creative, super creative ads, they don't lead to sales. They just lead to reactions like, that's so cool. It's so creative. It doesn't lead to a reaction like, I want that. I need that. So if your writing is not selling, it has failed. Like, it's just point blank. You have lost money. And it's just, we can like go deeper inside of that, like what that actually means. It's like whenever you're, it, it deals with people as well. Like whenever you're talking to people, you're selling something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's what I mean by that. Buying something and buying into something, those are two very different things. Like if you buy a product, it's just a transaction. But if you buy into a brand, it means you trust them. It means you love them. It means whatever they put out there, you want, you love it, right? So it's the same with people. Whenever you're meeting someone for the first time, whenever you're meeting someone for a second, third, fourth time, like on a regular basis, or whenever you're meeting someone for the last time and you don't even know it, you're leaving them with something, you're selling something. And that something is called an impression. Mm -hmm. So if the impression is bad, if it doesn't convert to some sort of emotion that says, I want to meet that person again, I want to have that person in my life. I want to follow that person's content on social media, right? That means your impression has not been good. Or in other words, like if we're talking brand copy, your copy has failed. So yeah, write better, sell better is really just, like you said, a very ominous concept. But that's truly what it is. Because if your writing is not converting, is it good? Is it bad? I feel like it's, you know, it's it's bad. Like at the very end of things, like you can't say it's good. It's just bad. It, it's failed at the very least. Drop the mic. And, and that's what it is. <laughs> Amazing. Now, so insightful so far. I, yeah, again, I am going to be watching back this session, taking notes. Um, yeah, the reason why you're booked and busy, because you're amazing. Um, everyone in the chat as well saying they're finding this super helpful. Um, some interesting qu questions, um, comments from Roman, but we'll skip over those. Um, Charlotte has said, harsh, but true. My clients would cry, um, but love the kind of honesty and real raw reality of writing to sell there. Awesome. Um, awesome. Amazing. So guys, tons of questions in the chat. Um, I guess we'll just dive into them. There are 37. So we'll try and clump as many together as possible. Yeah. Um, I turned on the magic feature where people can like thumbs up questions too. Um, so I will have a scroll, see which have the thumbs up, which do you guys want answered? Um, I'll check the chat as well to make sure we're all good. Amazing. So question one is what are the three biggest no-nos of writing? Oh. Oh, that's good. I feel like I have more than three, <laughs> but I think I would still repeat some of the stuff I said. If your writing is only about stuff that's not relatable to your audience, it could be like too much me, me, me content. Like this could be social media, like personal brands or, or, or even company brands. It means you're not providing something valuable, right? 
if you're, there's a creative way to do this. If you're providing a me, me, me story, but actually leaving it with a lesson inside, all of a sudden it's a different story, then it's good. So a big no-no is if you don't leave them with anything. So always include something that the audience can connect with. As far as um, other stuff, I feel like too much wordiness. And this is the phrase itself, too much wordiness. Like I could have just said wordiness, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like brands sometimes go over the top thinking that people will just read it no matter what. No, they won't. You know, like if you're saying stuff that could be shorter, it's it's the equivalent of this meeting could have been an email, (laughs) right? (laughs) So if you're saying stuff like just to use words and sound smarter and just to make it longer for me, like just give it to me straight because people no longer have time. Like that's just the gist of it. We, we have, we live so like such faster lives nowadays. Everything is moving faster. The way we consume content is like at the swipe of a finger. It's no longer at the click of a button and then you wait. It's literally at the swipe of a finger. So it's like seconds to get someone's attention. So if your content is too wordy, it's too problematic. Mm-hmm. And this goes for any sort of medium, any sort of medium. Even if you're writing paragraphs and you have like a, a giant paragraph and it's just two long sentences, like make it four, five, six sentences, but because that's going to make it easier to pause and reflect, pause and reflect, pause and understand. So other things obviously are when the copy itself is not enough. Yeah. Copy is visual. Remember, we said that. But oftentimes, whenever brands put out these poster ads or social media posts that has only text in it, I feel like it would be such a better, such a like more effective campaign if they included some sort of imagery. I always say that the greatest love story is copywriters and graphic designers. That's when magic happens. So a lot of times brands feel like their their copy is super strong. And they're like, ditch the graphic elements of it because they don't feel like it's needed. Sometimes it is needed I love because that. there's no context, right? They cannot imagine what you're telling them. Or if it's like super creative copy without an actual example, without imagery, without context, it's going to get lost in translation. So it's just some no-nos. It's really just about simplifying everything, like simplify the understanding of your copy. That's what it boils down to. Awesome. All of those no-nos. I think that my biggest flaw when it comes to any sort of copy, whether it's PLM content, work with clients, or especially on my LinkedIn, is I am like I'm a chatter, but not just a chatter, like I am a waffler. If you rewatch this webinar, you could probably cut out at least 20 minutes of me waffling. Um, because there are just like thoughts to mouth. It, it just rolls out. Um, and I'm exactly the same when I'm like writing my content, but something that I've been really trying, as you've been explaining so well, is making things simpler, clever. Making- By the way, I forgot one more no-no. Ooh, uh-huh. Don't ever use the word synergy, please, for the love of God. <laughs> People who follow me know I hate the word synergy, right? And here's why. Like, if you look up the definition of the word synergy, mm-hmm. it's literally like two sides connecting and creating something better. Yeah. But if you have to tell me that we have a synergy, then do we even have a synergy? I feel like every conversation you have with a client is synergy every collaboration is synergy every sort of engagement even if it's just a look at a billboard that's synergy so if you have to tell me it's like hey Sophie we're recording right now I'm looking at you right it's like brand selling like we're about to create synergy like every interaction is synergy like you don't even have to say it and it goes back to the principle that says show don't tell like explain or like lead with some benefits that tell me what the synergy is about, but don't tell me that it's a synergy. I feel like the word is, again, one of those big words that has been overused over time. And it just means absolutely nothing, at least for me as a copywriter. Like I I abhor that word. I, I just don't ever use it. And whenever I see it on clients' website, if, websites, if I have to like refine and revise their websites and audit it, I'm like, that needs to go first. Mm-hmm. So yeah, synergy, it's like telling me something I already know. So why are you even telling me, right? Mm-hmm. Megan in the chat has agreed. They have said, lol, I hate that word. <laughs> awesome. A few other agreements in the chat as well. Um, awesome. 
I love that. Um, amazing question from Anna, um, which has lots of upvotes as well. Um, so Anna has asked, what are your go-to resources as a copywriter? Oh, nice one. I feel like for me, at least recently, it has been a lot of LinkedIn. Uh, it's the only social platform I use. I'm actually a pretty, um, when it comes to social media, I try to stay away from it because Facebook is like for my aunts and grandmas and whatever, at least like in my personal case, Instagram is too visual for me and I'm more of a writer. TikTok, again, is too visual for me and I'm more of a writer. And I don't have time, like with all the obligations that I have, I would love to get into TikTok, but I just don't have time. So LinkedIn is where it's at for me. And I feel like just following a bunch of great creators all across the board yeah. gives me inspiration. And the funny thing with me is I get the most inspiration from non-copywriting stuff. Ooh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to follow people in different industries, like graphic designers, how do they approach stuff? Like Chris Doe from the future. To me, he's been the biggest mentor over the years. He knows it, like I've told him this many times, and he's very engaged with his community. The way they approach things at the future, like just the way they talk to clients, the way they present projects with a mood board, I'm like, what the hell is even a mood board? Like when I first saw it, that immediately gives me ideas to translate into my business, like how I communicate with clients, how I write my copy, how I present my copy. I'll just give you a random example. Like I did not used to do this before. Like whenever I would write copy for clients and they like needed, okay, Jay, hey, Jay, can you give us like 10 options for this new billboard campaign? Okay. And then I would just send them like a PDF or just copy paste those 10 options in an email, right? And that would be it. I would wait for the feedback and that's done. I feel like for the time being back then, it was all I knew, but then I learned how to do it better. Present instead of deliver. And Chris though is, and the future team were actually the ones to teach me this. Like whenever you're sending your copy, your logo, your, your whatever deliverable to your clients, explain what it is. Like almost like you pitch it. Like don't let them think and understand what it is. Direct their thinking by telling them, this is the thing that I had in mind. This is how it came out. This is the intention behind this. This is the effect I wanted to achieve with this. So immediately it helps them paint this greater picture of what you actually wanted to do instead of them understanding it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I draw inspiration from many people. As far as copywriters go, like just to keep it on topic, on brand, like Eddie Schleiner from Very Good Copy, Dina Chalakovic and Stevan Kontrat from Authority Marketing, they're pretty big on LinkedIn. Um, it's just, I mean, I could list a lot of copywriters is just a whole list. Like I, I'll probably even make a post on LinkedIn about this, but it's just a giant list. Like graphic designers, um, marketers in general, people who work in recruiting, people who are um, all in on like mindset coaching. I draw inspiration from all of those things mm -hmm. because all of them have a very unique way of saying things. And I'm the type of person who's like, oh, that's unique. Let me try that. I always want to try new things and I always want to test new things. So yeah. That. It's all over the place as far as inspiration goes. No, awesome, great answer. I will um, steal a list from you actually after this session and we can do like a roundup of all of your favorite creators or people that you oh find in like the, um, there's like a bio section on YouTube. So we can hash, we can hash that out together. Okay. Um, a really awesome question from Megan and something I wanted to ask earlier actually um, is who are the brands that you think kill it with their copy? Oh my. <laughs> I mean, I can give you the usual suspects. Yeah. With like, you know, Apple, it's like super simple, clean. It makes you like want the product, even though like you, you don't even need it, like you want it. I can give you the Chili Pipers of the world who have been popping up in the, in the, in the recent years. But I feel like for me, it's the small brands or at least like newer brands like pitch.com. Mm -hmm. I recently, came across some of their um, social media content and advertising content. Their product is called Pitch and it's essentially Canva for presentations. Like that's how I would describe their product, like specifically for presenting and giving webinars and um, whatever. And the product name is Pitch. So their tagline was don't present, pitch. To me, that was super clever 
in a way that wasn't risky and like even though it was clever it was super easy to understand because it was, it was on brand so yeah pitch was is one of the brands where i like really like to copy because it it has personality it speaks yeah. about um their brand i love d brand even yeah. though it's the opposite of who I am as a person, like personality wise, because it's like almost insulting the way they talk to customers, but it's on brand for them. Dbrand does amazing social copy. Their emails and their newsletters, my goodness, whenever they're dropping new products, like just the captions on social media, everything is spot on. Like it, it feels like you're talking to this roaster, right? This stand up comedian, and they're just, being great at work that's essentially what it uh what it is so yeah just um i could i could give you a whole list of examples here but yeah as far as brands that like not everyone knows those would be like some mm -hmm. awesome i love that. that was great answer um next question obviously pretty little marketer is up there with the best sorry for not mentioning that no but genuinely not because you're here but like the content is super genuine and i feel like because a lot of it connects to you personally sophie it feels human right it's not, not like it's this marketing community where creators can come and learn together eh. it's literally like you sharing your story where you've been you can do it too all the things we've been talking about like people can connect to that and people can relate to the story and because you're like it's almost like they're not tuning in with you in your life it's almost like you're tuning into theirs and i feel like that's the you know, most unique thing that plm does so Oh, thank you. What lovely feedback. I appreciate that a lot. As I say all the time, what I really try and do, I'm not like an expert copywriter. I try, but like my whole thing is typing how I talk. Um, I think that's like the best way for me to work with clients to really try and like foolproof how I try and connect with people. So now I'm pleased that uh, it's somewhat working. So I appreciate the feedback very much. So um awesome right i'll try and get through one or two more questions um a really good question um you were saying earlier about grabbing the reader's attention how that kind of first line should be about them um and this question is the idiot proof way of grabbing a reader's attention from the first sentence okay i feel like i have two ways that are always idiot proof and that's you start with how to that like always gets the job done just start with how to and then something and use numbers because both of these things do something in the human mind and it's it tells you it's possible right like if you just said write better emails okay okay it sounds good but if you said how to write better emails it immediately like signals to the brain the human brain that it's oh it's possible so how do you write it you know, better emails. Or if you use numbers, it makes it even more hefty as a statement, like seven ways to write better emails. So now you not only know it's possible, you actually feel like there's more ways than one. Yeah. Right. So use numbers and start with how to. I feel like those are idiot proof, foolproof, fail safe ways to make your copy attention grab. Amazing. I love those. I think it's Matt. Baker or Barker, please, someone, I think Roman will be able to correct Barker, me. I think, yeah, I think it's Barker. Um, he always, it, like, he'll start thread with, like, three reasons or, like, like pop a number in there. And I always read his content. Um, I really love that tip. I always fall back on numbers some days. So I'm struggling. Here are three reasons yep. why or three ways or three things that work for me. Um, also, clearly love the number three. Um, amazing. And then final question from Roman, because I think this is a really nice one. Um, I know you mentioned that you find your inspiration everywhere. So this kind of follows on from that question. Um, and our final question is, where do you get your daily writing inspiration? Honestly, I'd say non-social media stuff. Uh-huh. Like, I like to watch Netflix shows. I get inspired by the way people talk. Like, Suits, my all-time favorite show. Oh, they use so many cool expressions and phrases and punchlines, and it's so inspirational. Because now I feel like I can use it not only in my social media content, I can actually use it with clients on calls and sound, like, very authoritative. You know, um, yeah, I feel like it's non-social media content. I get inspired easily by that. And not only that, I whenever I like 
have to like get in the mood and concentrate on a topic. My way of concentrating on something is spending 10 to 15 minutes just watching something on YouTube, whether it's a podcast, whether it's something that's outside of the realm of what I'm doing. I'm not going to consume content that's like super copy heavy. I'm just going to consume something that's totally out of my marketing writer's world. And that really helps me. Awesome. No, totally agree. I am, um, whenever I'm struggling, I shared this like tiny hack that I've used a few times on LinkedIn a while back is I will listen to like a podcast in my niche, which of course is freelancing, social media, LinkedIn. I'll listen to a podcast where they'll be interviewing an expert and I will write down the questions that they are being asked. Um, and I essentially steal them as, as like tiny content ideas. And so I will then use my content to answer that question. Um, but I love what you said there, like even Netflix can spark an idea. Um, Suits is also a great pick. Would you say that's like your favorite series of all time or is there one? Yeah. Suits is definitely my favorite. I watched it like 20 times, all nine seasons. Don't judge me. <laughs> we love to see it. Good pick. A uh, man of taste. <laughs> also, I really wanted to get to actually. So I'm very pleased that you're staying. Okay. Um, so anonymous attendee has said, you mentioned you upskilled yourself in the world of copywriting. Are there any particular resources that you use at the beginning and any that you would recommend, please? Yeah, I actually, that answer to me is very easy because when I first started writing copy, I did not know too much about it. Like I only knew what I knew from experience. Like I was writing stuff, but it was not research-based or science-based or even education-based, right? I didn't learn this stuff. I just did it without knowing what it was. So it was usually the top results on Google, uh, like HubSpot stuff, uh, stuff from Neil Patel's blog. Um, what was it? It's not direct marketer. Uh, what, what, what are they called? digitalmarketer.com, I think. Um, so yeah, those would be the resources. And they actually, like HubSpot's how-to articles are like, you need hours to just go through them. So I feel like that was, to me, super helpful. And they usually come with a lot of experience, uh, examples. Eddie Schleiner's, uh, like for the past two years, like micro blogs or micro articles, as he calls them, it's verygoodcopy.com. Spectacular resource. Ace Oasis. Also, uh, marketingexamples.com by Harry Dry. Mm -hmm. He's been a guy who just randomly started posting these things he found online. It was almost like his swipe file, like his inspiration file, where he screenshotted stuff online and he put them in one place. And then he just started sharing that and people found value in it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those would be some of the examples. HubSpot, uh, Digital Marketer, Neil Patel, very good copy. Uh, marketingexamples.com. So yeah, those those definitely would be the top ones for me where I learned the most. And outside of copywriting, I highly advise any creative to go subscribe to Chris Doe's The Future channel. That's The Future without the E at the end. And go watch the Making a Brand documentary. It's around 10 or 12 episodes long. It's almost like a Netflix documentary and it's spectacular. I'm not going to tell you what it's about, but just the way, if you work with a lot of clients in various industries, that's going to be hella inspirational for you, I'm sure. Awesome. I love those picks. I love marketing examples. Um, and Harry, he did a webinar that I will, if you follow PLM on Instagram at Pretty Marketer, I'll link it on stories later. Um, but Harry Dry did a webinar with the marketing meetup um, mm -hmm. where he talked all about copy and how he's grown his business and marketing examples and his newsletter. And it was other than this one, of course, one of the most insightful um, webinars, like totally free as well, that I have ever seen. And um, so I will link it on stories for you guys later. Um, awesome. But yeah, love those recommendations. A few in there that I also love. Um, um, Danielle has asked, obviously you mentioned your 12 principles earlier and we kind of dove into three. Um, Danielle has asked if there is anywhere that we can find the full 12 principles. Actually, let me go through. Actually, just give me one second. I will literally go and open up one of my lessons with my students. Like, I kid you not, I'm literally in my folder right now and I'll paste it in the comment section. So, this, some of them you might know. Um, let me just go to my second monitor right here. So, uh, it's not in the QA box, it's going to be in the chat box. So, here we go. Amazing. I love um, the KISS acronym. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> One of my yeah, there's different ways people describe that um, yeah. acronym. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it stupidly simple. 
keep it uh i have no idea it's just different ways people describe but it's essentially just keep it as simple as possible at the at the level where even a five-year-old can understand it love that i'll copy and paste it in there too i've also saved that so i'll pop it in the description of the youtube thingy trying to kind of trying to get get the hang of this whole youtube thing so this is the stuff i'm teaching to these future generations at the university so hopefully someone will find some use in it Absolutely. And I know I said last time we caught up as well, like I am so envious of your students because not only do they have you, an incredible teacher, but like I did a whole three year marketing degree and I don't think I was taught on copywriting once and everything you've shared today is an, totally just an invaluable skill that I think any marketer could and should refine. Um, so deeply envious of your students. They, they're very lucky to have you. You're most welcome. And I'm so glad and humbled to hear that so thank you awesome right tons of questions still left but <laughs> if anyone has a question that we haven't had time to get around to I know that you share so much content on LinkedIn so super valuable as well um so for anyone who wants to follow you keep up your journey um get in touch with you connect with you where can they find you on the internet LinkedIn full stop so <laughs> <laughs> I am the most active on LinkedIn. I post every single day. Um, and yeah, I try to keep up with every single comment I get. Um, that's actually my daily mission, like to respond to every single comment. And people who do send me messages, um, even though it sometimes might take a while, like a few days or a week, I genuinely try to respond to everyone's DMs. If I can't respond via text, I'll just record a voice memo for you. So if you know people need advice, people just want to you know, my eyes for something, a quick review or audit, like I genuinely trying to try to help. So yeah, just don't go overboard, guys. My DMs are pretty full, but yeah, I'm always open to help, like genuinely open to help. So yeah. amazing. you're a star. And I mean, as I said, your content is incredible anyway. So like guys recommend having a scroll and a read. I know on your Hey J website as well, you have like a roundup of a lot of your LinkedIn posts as well. So if you yeah. guys want to pop over there, Highly recommend the read. I've had a few scrolls recently, and I'm sure I'll be heading back, heading back to your profile okay. soon. Wow, one of my favorites. Um, but thank you so much for your time today. Um, I feel like I've gushed a hundred times, but I have learned so much. Your story, everything that you've taught today. Um, by far one of my favorite people on the internet. Um, we're so lucky to have spent an hour with you. Um, guys watching, I hope that you have learned as much as I have. Um, if you're watching on the recording, let us know in the comments, pop a like on YouTube, whatever it might be. Have you enjoyed today's session? Let us know one thing that you learned. Um, feel free to tag us in your LinkedIn posts as well. I love those. Um, I actually have a screenshot folder on my phone where I screenshot everything that PLM's tagged in. Um, and sometimes I read it back and cry, but in a good way, um, because that's, you know, it's what we do over here. Um, but thank you again, Jay, that's so, so much um, for your time. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'll be back next week at 12 o'clock with Billy Forbes. We're going to be talking all about burnout. Um, so if you're a stress head like me and you want to learn some well-being strategies, um, I'm actually really excited to, to learn how to look after this a little better with Billy. Um, hopefully see you next week. And Jay, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys. Like just without adding anything to this anymore, I feel like you rounded it up perfectly. Just a big giant Thank you to you, Sophie, and to everyone who was here today and who, everyone who's still going to watch this afterwards, whether on YouTube or on LinkedIn, and to everyone who's, I assume, just going to, you know, comment and ask even more questions now. I'm, you know, we're, we're there to support each other. This is, this is a community. I always tell people, so let's make this a community. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.